I've asked Him many times, you know, Lord, we don't have to be the great, the biggest, or the most popular, but I just want to be able to look out into the flock, the body that I'm a part of, and I want to be able to see Your fingerprint, Your handiwork in the people. And I can honestly say that I see that, and I see what God is doing. You know, we're coming up on two years that we've been here. I don't know how many were here when we we first started, but along the way you've come and uh, joined up and been a part of what the Lord is doing. And I can see growth, and I can see change, and I can see maturity. And I believe this is the time, this is the hour that, that God has been preparing us for. It's for a time such as this, you know, that we have been called. It's, you know, we don't gather to church just to say that we've been to church. And, you know, we don't. We come to meet with the Lord. And in the Lord's presence, stuff happens, right? Good things happen. And we've, we've all along, you know, I don't know how many times I've been preaching just about being vessels that God can fill and God can use and God emptying us of ourself and filling us with Himself. It's for a reason. It's for a purpose. And I believe in these last days that we're in, that's really going to prove to be true. And it's really going to shine. And I believe that God is getting ready to do marvelous things, to do wonderful things. And I want to be a part of it. And I want you to be a part of it. Keep drawing near to Jesus. Keep running after Him. Keep seeking Him. And what a good thing sometimes that... You know, calamities and hard things uh, cause us to, to do is seek the Lord and to walk closer to Him than we have before. And that's what this time should be, to, to draw near to the Lord and to, to be with Him. If you would turn with me this morning to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. Find the book of Psalms and take a right. And look around in that area for it. Uh, but he's in there, I promise. Uh, and I've just been seeking the Lord. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I've had this Word in my heart for, for a while now. And I, uh, I just really feel that now is the time to, to share it and to give it to you. And I pray this morning that the Lord would really give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to receive what, what He is doing. But Ezekiel chapter 37, when you find it, say Amen. amen. We're going to read 14 verses, a little bit lengthy this morning, but I want you, if you're not familiar with this story, I want to read it to you so at least you will have that. But... Ezekiel 37 and verse 1, it says, "...the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry." And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, Thou knowest. And again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and I will cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you will know that I am the Lord." And I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, and there, but there was no breath in them. And then he said unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these that have been slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as He commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then He said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. 
and we are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, and I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. And I shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. And I want to preach a message this morning entitled, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O ye bones. Father, we just come and we ask You this morning that You would help us, God, to minister, Lord, Your heart and Your Word in this hour. And Father, I pray that You would give us, Lord, ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive and understand, God, what You've called us to in this hour. Father, I pray that as this message said, Lord, You would cause the wind to blow. Lord, You would cause Your Spirit to move and to raise us up, Father, to be a mighty army in the day and time that we live in. Oh God, I thank You that You do open graves. God, I thank You that You do cause dead, dry bones to live again. Lord, I thank You, God, that You can take weak people and You can build Your an exceeding great army. You can build Your army. Lord, let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour, Father, and I just ask that You would speak to our hearts today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And Amen. Ezekiel, if you read the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that his calling to the nation was the calling of a watchman. If you look the word watchman up in the Word of God, it means to warn people of a coming judgment And it also means to declare the Word of the Lord. That's what Ezekiel was called to, to be a watchman in in the nation. And the, the watchman really in this time, it was a picture of a man or a woman who would stand in a watchtower at the gate or near the gate along the wall of the city. And the watchman would look at the landscape day after day. He would look at it and he would become very familiar with what the landscape and the road leading into that place looked like. And each day he would look for anything out of place, anything out of, out of the ordinary. He could see what was coming. He could see if, you know, if an army or an enemy was coming, he would see it before it got there. And it was his job to warn the people, hey, our enemies are coming. Prepare and get ready. Protect yourself. Be ready to fight. You know, be be prepared for for what is coming. And his calling was to be a watchman and it was to be a prophet to declare the Word of the Lord and to declare the heart of God to the people. You can read about this call. You should today when you get home in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17 through verse 21. And this is what God told the prophet Ezekiel was that he had made him a watchman to the nation. And he said this, If you see the sword coming, if you see judgment coming, and you warn the people, and even if they don't listen to you, you warn them anyway, and the blood is off of your hands. It's your call just to give them the Word of God. And when you do that, you deliver your soul. But he said, if you see the sword coming, if you see the judgment of God coming upon these people, and you don't say anything, you keep your mouth shut and silent, their blood I will require at your hand. So it was a weighty thing that that he had. It was a weighty thing that he was supposed to, to do. The watchman was a lookout. He was to keep watch. He was to observe very closely. And he was there for the protection of a city. He was there for the protection of a whole city of people. You know, what if he looked out on that horizon and he saw that enemy coming and he didn't say anything, he just ran off because he really only loved himself. He didn't care about the people, but to really love those people, you would warn them, right? He was there to protect that city. He was there to protect the family. Also, he was there to protect the harvest. Because at harvest time was when it was really dangerous because they've done all the work They've plowed the fields. 
They've sown seeds. They've beat out the weeds and the foxes and all this kind of stuff. And now it's almost harvest time. And here comes that enemy because he wants to steal the harvest. How many of you know it's about harvest time in America? I believe Jesus said that the fields are white with harvest. And He said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would raise up and send out laborers out into the harvest. I believe that's what God has been doing is preparing a people to labor out inside of that harvest. He's preparing a people that not just know the Word of God, but they also know the heart of God, right? And to deal with people like Jesus deals with people. To be a watchman on the wall. I believe that every Christian is to be a watchman Watchman. Every parent is to be a watchman. Every preacher of the gospel is to be a watchman of people. You know, when you come into church, it's not just to be pumped up and to be made to feel good. It's to hear the Word of God. We know that God's Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I want Kyle and I, we're talking about this week, you know, when I preach the Word of God, I want you to understand that I want to put myself at the front of the line and say, God, what You're showing me and giving me to say, do it in me first. I don't want to just be you know, pointing my finger at You. I preach to myself as much as I preach to anybody. I'm probably harder on myself than I am. I'm my own greatest critic, you know? Because I want to be right. The, the Apostle Paul said, you know, I don't want to just preach to others and find myself a castaway. I don't want to preach the truth to other people and find myself shipwrecked or or rejected or cut off from God. But our duty is not to just pat people on the back and make people feel good. It's to help let people hear the Word of the Lord. There's a sword. There is judgment at the door. You know, just like we talked about with Moses and the people of Israel at the Passover. Get in that house with the blood on the door and you will be safe. Run to Jesus in this time and in this hour because I really believe that worse things are coming to the United States of America. I believe this is the beginning of sorrows. Jesus talked about that. We're probably going to talk about it some tonight. But He talked about pestilences and diseases and wars and rumors of wars. And He says this is the beginning of sorrows. Look at what's happening out in the world today. Things have been shut down. Schools, universities, uh, professional sports teams have canceled their season. And I really believe it's because God has something to say in this hour. So many times people are too busy going here or there and they're caught up in that. People will drive for hours to be at a, you know, a football or a sporting event, some kind of a game, but they can't drive 20 or 30 minutes to be at church on a Sunday morning. God says, I'll tell you what I'll do. If I can't get your attention now, I'll shut everything down. I will move heaven and earth. I will shake everything everything that can be shaken because God has something to say in this hour. God has raised up watchmen. I believe that in every family, those parents ought to be a watchman. You ought to look and know what your children and what your grandchildren are being involved in. So many parents, their philosophy is to put them in front of a TV or a cell phone so that that parent can go on and live their life however they want to do it. Someone told me just a couple years ago, I believe it was fourth grade girls were given cell phones with internet on them by their parents. And I just won't say what they were looking at on that phone. And they were going to school showing other students in the elementary school pornography on, on that cell phone. And I just, what business does a fourth grader have with a cell phone? Especially to be uncensored and, you know, unsupervised. And you put that inside of their hand, you're seeing the sword coming. But you're not saying anything and the devil is going to devour your family and your children and that's all he wants to do is steal, kill, and destroy. But God is bringing us into the light so that I can see things like I couldn't see them before. 
and to love people enough to open up our mouth and to tell them the truth of what God has to say to them. You know, folks, I believe this is a time. The end times. I believe that the coming of Jesus is very near. I've been thinking all week about Noah and how he built that ark. The Bible says that he was warned of God and he moved with fear. And he built an ark to the saving of his household. And I believe it was for 75 years that old man cut down trees. He, they didn't have a sawmill, you know, in a, a hardware store. I don't know where he got all that stuff from. Oh, it was an exhausting effort and it was a lonely effort. People didn't come out there to help him. People come out there to make fun of him and, and to talk about how crazy he was. And it was just a spectacle, spectacle for everybody to come out there and see. But day after day, old faithful Noah, he kept hammering boards into that ark. He kept telling his family, eight souls are being prepared to get on that ark. They're being prepared. You know, people, I'm sure they made fun of him and all this kind of stuff, but he loved his family. The Bible calls him a preacher of righteousness. I believe that Noah tried to preach to and warn and invite the people that were on the earth in his time. But he built that ark, and one day God told him, Noah, you and your family, come on in. And God shut the door. And after that, it started raining. It had never rained before. But it, but it started raining. And it rained for 40 days. It rained for 40 nights. People were all swept away. There was no more chance. There was no second chance. There was not... The time was to now. While that ark, the door of that ark was open, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They're eating, drinking, getting married. I, I don't believe that's just altogether evil things. I believe it just means they were going on with life as usual. I'm just living my best life. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm living for me, myself, and I. But Jesus said they knew not until the flood came and swept them all away. They didn't even know what was going on. God's given us eyes to see. God's not to just keep it to ourselves, but to tell other people. You know, I don't know if the world's going to end tomorrow. I don't think so. But Jesus could come today. I really believe that ark is being prepared. I believe He's preparing a people right now in this day and time and this hour because He's preparing a people called the Bride of Christ. It's not an exclusive just us club. It's whosoever will come. But you have to come to Jesus. You have to repent of your sins. You have to believe the Gospel. You have to be born again, you know. All of this, it's a must. It's a must. It's an absolute. It's the one way to come. So God had called him to be a watchman. I believe that God wants us to be watchmen in this hour. As Christians, as believers, we look at the landscape not to just be critical of everything and everybody. That's, that's not. There's a right way to do the right thing, right? There's a right way to, pre- to present the Gospel to people. The Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. But nonetheless, speak the truth. And let people know what's going on. Let people know what God is doing. Not to just be concerned about this physical body. Jesus said, don't fear the one that can just kill your body. But He said, fear the one that can kill your body and then cast both your body and your soul in hell. Fear Him. I want to walk in the fear of God. Not the fear of man. Not the fear of what's going on. But in the fear of God. God raises up this man to be a watchman. A heart for God. The Bible says in the story that we read that God took him in the Spirit to a valley. And when he got out there, God set him down in the midst of a valley full of dry bones. God brought Ezekiel to a situation that looked hopeless. I believe in the in the hour that we're living in, it's very similar to that in a hopeless hour. Look at what's going on. Look at what the world is doing. Look at what America is doing. Look, I read last week where the Republicans voted to push a bill that would administer life-saving medications 
to babies that had just survived abortion. In other words, you tried to kill the baby, but you didn't kill it. Now it's laying there on a stainless steel table. These people want to give it medicine that would save its life, and the Democrats shut it down. Understand, this is not a Democrat-Republican thing, and I'm not a political preacher. This is light versus darkness. This is the Spirit of God versus the Spirit of Antichrist. I grew up around cattle. And I know that if a mama cow just had a baby calf and you go out there in that pasture and grab a hold to that baby calf, that mama cow is fishing to eat you alive. She will. She will wreck you. She will slam you up against the side of a pickup truck and stomp you in the ground. It's a sick, sad day that a mama cow has more affection for its baby calf than a mother human being does for its own infant child. But that's the day that we live in, people. That's what's going on. It's a valley full of dry bones. God took Ezekiel down into the valley. A valley is a low place. I believe this is one of the things that God does with us is He brings us low, doesn't He? He humbles us. Simon Peter wrote that if you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, in due time, He's going to exalt you. If you try to exalt yourself, God is going to humble you. But if you will humble yourself before God, just like we preach all the time, you're not the vine. I'm not the vine. We are branches that by the grace of God have been plugged into that vine. The life of Jesus begins to flow through us as we continue in the faith and the fruit of our life is His fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But if I separate myself from Him, I'm going to dry up and wither up and I'm going, I'm going to die. God brought Ezekiel into that valley, a place of humility. And when he got there, the valley was full of dry bones. Nothing's alive in that valley. It's a valley of death. And the Bible said, we read in verse 2, there were very many bones and they were very dry. Very bad. Very, very little hope in this hour. Reason it happened. Death had occurred. There was no watchman. You look in, in the nation that we, that we live in today, you know, a whole lot of church, we see it, we talk about it all the time. People just go to church on Sunday and live however they want to live all during the week. People think they're going to heaven because they're Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal. People think they're going to heaven because they've been baptized in water. People have been going to church for 60 years and have never heard the Gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ. They don't know the power of the blood. They don't know the power of, of, of the cross. They don't know the power of regeneration. They don't know what it means to be born again or to be filled with the Spirit because nobody wants to tell them. Nobody wants to... Do we love God? Do we love people? Then we need to love them enough to tell them the truth of what the Bible says. You know, I didn't write this book. I didn't make things the way they are. But I know this. One day, I'm going to have to stand before this great God and give an account for my ministry. And I don't want it to be, well, I just, you know, I just wanted to pat people on the back. I don't want to be responsible for sending people to hell. I want to be on that watchtower. And if I see that sword coming, I want to blow that that trumpet, I want to let you know, you let me know so that we can be ready, so that we can be prepared, and so that judgment does not strike us down, but we're ready. What a, what a thing it would be if that enemy got to the gate of that city, and instead of finding little old peasants that didn't even know what was going on, they found an army that's equipped, that's been prepared, walking in the whole armor of God. Amen. That's what God's doing. <laughs> that's the reason for that watchman. Prepare. Prepare the people. But when there's no watchman, death comes. The enemy slaughters. That's what's happened in America. Number two, there's no obedience. Even at times when there has been a watchman, it goes in one ear and out the other. 
How many people have you really shared the Gospel with and you tried to help? And How many people really know the, the right way, but they don't go that way? It's because without obedience, it's, it, it, God wants, we have to follow after. The Bible says that, you know, that without, without, uh, with, without faith, without works is dead. If we just say we believe, but that, that faith, uh, that, that believing that we have, it doesn't change our life, it don't change who we are, then that's, that's dead. It's unfruitful. But a real faith in Jesus and what He has done for us, it's going to produce change, and it's going to pr- produce life, and it's going to produce obedience. In the valley full of dry bones, there's no light. You know, folks, if we just come to church and we just play games with God, then we're not doing ourselves any good and we're not doing the world any good. Jesus said one time that He was the light of the world. He come back another time and said, you are the light of the world. It's Christ in us, operating in us, dwelling in us, that makes us the light of the world. I'm not anybody's light. I got just as much darkness as the next man. You leave me alone without God, I'll show you what a messed up human being really looks like. But if I let Jesus live inside of me, there's light there. Because He is the light. And that light wants to shine. But understand, God did not bring Ezekiel into that valley just to show him what was wrong. world's full of people that can just point out what's wrong. We spend a lot of time just doing that, pointing out what's wrong. When God shows you what's wrong, just like when God deals with us in our life, He may say, you know, Bill, you need to stop talking like that. Or Robert, you need to stop acting like that. Or Kyle, you need to stop going there. Or Pete, this in your life, it don't work. It, it doesn't... It doesn't go. It doesn't fit the new person that you are in Christ Jesus. Well, God didn't show you that just to shame you and to condemn you. He showed you that because He wants to fix it in your life. Many God comes and shows us what the problem is, not to just beat us over the head, but to teach us and and to show us and and to show us that that whatever that thing is in our life, He defeated it at Calvary's cross, and He's already given you victory. Now you just need to believe that what Jesus did for you is enough in the situation that you're in and start walking by faith and watch God change your character. Watch Him change your desires. Watch Him change your heart. God didn't bring Ezekiel there just to show him what was wrong. He wanted to do something, right? Oh, oh, don't you know in this earth today, God wants to do something. God don't let just a virus come. It's got everybody sick and afraid. No, God wants to do something. I believe with all of my heart, God wants to send revival to America. If I didn't believe in revival, I believe I'd stay at home. I'd finish cutting my grass this morning. But because I believe in revival, I got up this morning. I I went to church. I'm I'm preaching this morning because I believe just like God caused Ezekiel to preach to them dry bones and they become a living army. I believe that God wants to send us into a hopeless and desperate situation. And He's looking for somebody with enough faith that will prophesy Son of Man to them dry bones. And God's going to start doing things. God's going to cause things to happen. I have friends that don't believe in revival. They just believe that things are just going to get worse and worse. I believe things are going to get worse, but I also believe in the midst of chaos, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of disease, Jesus is reaching into this old world. And He's reaching for salvation. He's reaching for whosoever will. And I believe there's going to be a people, it may not be the majority, but it is going to be somebody grab a hold of that nail-scarred hand Their life is going to be changed. They're going to be the trophy of God's grace and the testimony of the power of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, He does. God takes His prophets. God takes His people and He puts them in places that are not always great. That's been my experience. It's some of the places that I've been. And God has sent me and God has planted me in. Everything is not always great. It's not always right. And it's not always easy. 
Oh, what if God would have took Ezekiel to the mountaintop where the the flowers are blooming and the trees are budding and there's fruit on every limb. There would be no work for him to do. But instead, that man of God had something burning on the inside of him. He had the call of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So he said, I'm going to take you all this time. Son, I've been preparing you for such a time as this. I'm putting you in the middle of this valley full of death because there is a river of life flowing out of you. Jesus said in John chapter 7, He that believes upon Me, as the Scripture has said, out of His belly, out of His innermost being, will come flowing rivers of living water. That's what God's been doing all this time, folks, is pouring into us His Word, His Spirit, His power. We've walked through some troubled waters. We've walked through time Oh my God, this week we were praying at our house and I just wept and wept and I said, Jesus, I almost didn't make it here. I almost fainted. I almost gave up. The Bible says in Psalms 27, I would have fainted except I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So many times I wanted to lay down and quit. So many times I wanted to give up. So many times I said I cannot keep doing this. But it was the goodness and the grace of Jesus that He carried me and He strengthened me and He put something inside of my heart that says you can't quit here. We're almost through this valley. We're almost to the next one, Son. I'm preparing you. I'm putting something in your heart. You're going to walk through these hard times and these deep waters so that when you get into the face of battle, oh God, your face will be like a flint. You'll be a soldier that's been prepared for battle and you won't run away. You won't be afraid, but you'll know just like David God has given me the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And I'm not afraid to stand before this Philistine because I know God will give me His head as surely as the sun rises in the morning because God has been faithful. That's exactly what God is doing. He takes us into hard places, difficult places, but in the darkest hour. Oh, somebody said the darkest hour is just before dawn. Just before the sun rises in the morning. I've been, have you ever been hunting and been sitting out in the woods and it seems like you're just about to freeze to death right before that sun comes up? It's dark and, it, and the temperature's dropping. But if you'll hold on just a little while over the top of them trees, that sun's going to come. It's going to light things up. It's about to warm things up. I believe that sun is going to rise in the, in the darkest days. One of my friends several years ago told me he had a dream that there was a big, huge pile of rubble and concrete in a city. Just destruction. Some kind of calamity had swept through there. But he said up on top of that pile of concrete, there were preachers of the Gospel. And at first, there were just a few standing up there. But as time went on, a crowd started gathering. And, and pretty soon, it was such a crowd that you couldn't see from one side or the other. People were coming to hear the Word of God. I believe that God will do whatever He can to get the attention of people. And I believe that the darker it gets, you know, it's a, the darker it gets in a room, the brighter the light shines. The brighter the light. It, it don't matter how dark it gets in there, if there's one light on, everybody in that darkness is going to be able to see that light. I believe that's what God is doing. I believe that God is going to cause that light to shine. The prophet of God stands in a hopeless, the middle of a hopeless situation, and God asks him a question Can they live? Son of man, can these bones live again? God don't ask anybody a question that he don't know. It was a test. What do you think, son of man? What's in your heart? God knew, but he asked this man, Can these bones live again? God looks for a vessel to use. Ezekiel, are you the man? Are you the one that I can use in this valley? He looks for somebody to believe. God's looking in this hour for a vessel that He can fill. God's looking for a, for a person in this hour that will believe Him. Somebody that will walk in faith. Somebody with enough faith to go out and preach 
to a boneyard in a place. As we said earlier, God knew exactly how to kill that Philistine giant. He just needed a little shepherd boy to walk down to that creek, get a couple of rocks, put them in the sling, and throw them at that giant. God knew exactly what He wanted to do. He just looks for somebody that will believe. Can God do something in this hour in our nation? Can God do something in this hour in His church? Can God do something, folks, in the middle of this boneyard, in the middle of this place of misery, in the middle of this place of death? Ezekiel, can these bones live again? Then we have the promises of faith. In verses 4, 5, and 6, God said to Ezekiel, prophesy. The word prophesy just simply means to preach or to proclaim. Prophesy upon these bones. And say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord unto these bones. God's talking to the dead bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you. You shall live. And I'll lay sin you in flesh and skin. And I'll put breath on you. And you will live. And you will know that I am the Lord. If God can find faith, Lord, You know these bones can live. You know that if I put it in Your hands and I trust You, God, and I'll be obedient to You, God, You know that these bones can live. And God says, this is, what I, this is the promise of faith. The Bible is full of faith promises of all the things that God will do if you can believe them. The Bible tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and I believe verse 20 that all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Everything that God promises is that the check is good in Christ Jesus, right? It's not good just because we speak the Word or because we know where it's written and we got it highlighted. It's in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God. Jesus is the source of everything that we receive from God and the cross. His blood is the means that God uses Jesus to get us get it to us. But God said, Ezekiel, if you'll go out and preach, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cause them bones to get up and start walking. I'm gonna cause them bones to, to, to grow back into real people, and I'm gonna cause these people to know that I am the Lord. There are promises of faith. Jesus gave us so many to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All power and all authority, He said, has been given unto Me. And He said, I am with you and I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you unto the end, even to the end of the age. He is with us today. Amen. We're not limited to what we can do. We're limited... <laughs> The Bible says that our God will supply all of our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The Bible says unto Him that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. If you, It's above. That's what God always has more. God has promises that He will save anyone to the uttermost that will come to God by Christ Jesus. God has promises that the sick definitely can be healed. God has promises that in the last days I will pour out of My Spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams. Old men are going to see visions and it will come to pass that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God promises in the end time that He's going to pour that Spirit out. God promises. What a wonderful thing that instead of our kids getting caught up in alcohol and drugs and pornography, oh, they're caught up in Jesus and the Spirit of God is being poured out upon them. And God is using them like Ezekiel to prophesy life in a valley of dead bones and in the middle of a hopeless situation. This is the promises of faith, folks. Folks, open up your mouth and say something. And then in verse 7 and 8, we see the obedience of Ezekiel. Just the first part of it. 
So I prophesied as I was commanded. How absurd is that? A man all by himself standing in the middle of a graveyard preaching to a heap of dry bones. Preaching to the graves. You look at all through this, folks. When God calls people to do stuff, it doesn't always make sense to the natural people. Just like us having church this morning, I don't expect everybody, I'm not going to, don't you do it either. We're not going to fight about it. We're not going to argue about it. Let people say what they want to say. I don't expect them to understand. Nobody understood why Noah. I don't believe that it even rained in the day of Noah. The Bible says that a dew came up from the ground and watered the earth. Nobody had ever seen that before. But this man really believes, really knows that he is, he is heard from God. It didn't make any sense. But look at the rewards of the obedience of faith. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, just a few days before, he denied that he even knew Jesus. But now here he is in the temple, standing up in the middle of the same crowd that had just crucified the Son of God. And you're going to preach to them? You are going to preach to them? Peter wouldn't have been my choice for a preacher and that crowd wouldn't have been the folks I'd want to preach to for my first message of our first church meeting, right? Amen. God called him to do something that didn't make any sense at all. And a man stepped out in faith full of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts and asked, what shall we do? 3,000 souls were entered into the kingdom of heaven. On over, I believe it's Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi. Their backs were bleeding. Their bodies were battered and bruised. And they were locked in the stocks in the inner prison. And along about midnight, the Bible says that they begin to pray and they begin to sing praises unto God. That don't make it. What are you singing about? What have you got to praise God for? Boy, I, I don't. my lip would have been poked out so far, you probably could have stepped on it. Not these men of God. Men of faith, right? Faith says, in spite of what I see, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to believe you. And if I'm here, that prison might as well be in a valley full of dry bones. Men of God open their mouth and they begin to praise God. They begin to call out to God. And the Bible says the earth shook. That prison was open. All the cells were open. The locks were unlocked. And the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Ends up his whole family gets saved. All because somebody did something that God called them to do that looked ridiculous and absurd in the natural. But if we will walk in faith, things begin to happen. God begins to work. God always honors faith. God, When God finds true faith in Christ, He always sends grace. Grace is the power and ability of God to do what we in ourselves are unable to do. Things begin to happen. God thinks. Not just us doing stuff, but God starts working. Supernatural things begin to occur. Bones start shaking. They begin to come together. Flesh and sin, sinew, skin. All of this because... God moves. God begins to open up doors. You know that if you'll act in faith, step out of the usual, step out of the normal, God begins to work. God begins to do things. Because you stepped out in faith, God began to open somebody's heart. God began to draw people. God started working in your family. God started working in somebody that you thought would never want to hear the Gospel message, but because you had more faith in God than you did fear in man, now people are asking you questions. Now people are, you know, you walked into work and you brought your Bible or you begin to have a prayer meeting. You begin to call on Jesus. You know, that that started entering your home. Whatever started happening... 
God began to move. God began to work. But God's not done yet. The, the Bible says that a noise, a rattling, and the skeletons begin to come together. But you know a skeleton is really only a shell of what used to be. There's no life inside of it. Keep preaching. Keep believing. Keep walking with God because I don't believe, I believe we just maybe got our big toe in the water of the ocean of what God wants to do. I thank God for the things that I've seen. I thank God for the miracles that He's done and for the lives that He has touched. Oh, but come on now. We don't want just a skeleton. We don't want just noise. We don't want just a little bit of racket. We want to see God go all the way. Ezekiel stood right there with faith in his heart and he began to preach as God commanded him to preach. And all of a sudden, you know, a head comes rolling in from over yonder. A bunch of ribs and a neck come from here. Arms and legs and feet and toes, bones. All this stuff starts coming together. God starts sending muscle and sinew and tissue and skin. But still, it's dead. It can be a lot of noise, but still no life. There was a church in the book of Revelation. I believe it was the church at Sardis. Jesus said, you've got a name that you live, but I looked at you and I found you to be dead, right? Oh, we want the real thing, folks. We want the life. Oh, what can God do? What can God do if He can just find the people that believe Him, a people that will walk in obedience to His Word and hear His voice and preach to a dry bone. You may, you may look at somebody and in your mind and in your heart you may be saying, boy, you are the driest bleached out bone I ever saw, but you don't know what my God can do with you. So I'm going to open up my mouth and I'm going to tell you, thus saith the Lord God unto you, dry bone. Oh, pray that, folks. Pray that for your, for your family. Pray that for your sons, for your daughters, for your parents, and for your grandparents, for the people that you work with. Oh God, Spirit of God, speak to these dry bones. And just because it don't come together the first time, you know, Ezekiel, something started happening the first time, but the job's not done yet. He could have went back to town and told everybody what he saw out in the desert today. He could have wrote a book about how he got bones to start moving out in the desert. But instead, no, I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to keep doing what God told me to do until I see a move of God. Until I see God finish the work that He began. And the Bible says God told Him, speak to the wind. Prophesy to the wind. And you're about to see something. Call upon the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as He commanded me. He began to preach and to prophesy again. And all of a sudden, the wind began to blow. The four winds began to blow onto those dry bones. The wind in the Bible, it represents the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the life of the church. The church of Jesus Christ is not a dead organism, but it's a living organism that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's empowered by the, by the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible says that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Right? He's the living God. His people are, are a living people. Think about Adam. The Bible says in the beginning that God made Adam out of the dust of the ground. But that man just lay in there. He was as dead as that dust ever was. But the Bible says that God breathed into His nostrils the breath of life and that man became a living soul. He became a living soul that would never ever die. Adam is going to be, I don't know exactly where he is this morning, but he's either in heaven with God or he's in hell and wherever he's at, he's always going to be there. You are a living soul because God put life in you. Every human being is a living soul and they're going to be eternal eternal somewhere because the breath of God that's inside of them, the church, is just a corpse without the Holy Ghost moving, operating, filling the people. 
I've been in churches and I know you have too. I've listened to preachers where I wonder, do you really believe what it is that you're talking to us about? Because it sure don't seem like it. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Ghost to fill us and to operate through us. Otherwise, we're just limp. The gospel preaching is not an intellectual argument. I can't convince or argue anybody to come into the kingdom of God. It's not to the head that God talks, it's to the heart. It's not the ability and talents of people that's going to reach a lost and a dying world. It's the people that are filled and empowered with the Holy Ghost. That's why God wants to pour out His Spirit on the day, time. That I've listened to people that have had a lot of talent and I didn't feel a thing in their song or in their message. But I've listened to other people that maybe they lacked in talent. Maybe they're like me, not a very good speaker. Come from a little one-stop sign town in Mississippi. Try to cover it up, but they can't. God can take that vessel. God can take that musician, that preacher, that boy, that girl, that man or woman, because they're not relying upon their own strength. They're relying upon God and His ability and what He's able to do. God's able to change. God's able to speak to people, change their life and save them. The corpse became a living army all because the Spirit of the Lord began to move. God began to draw God began to empower people, people that had been slain, people that had been defeated, people that had died, people that had fainted, people that had had given up. I believe that in the day and hour that we live, God is looking at us and asking us to be like the prophet Ezekiel. Stand in the middle of that hopeless situation. Don't you lay down and die with them because you're not like them. You're, you're different. God has put His life in you. His Spirit. His Word inside of you. And no matter how bad it gets, God puts you there not to be part of the problem, but God wants to use you to address, to speak to, and to be part of the solution of that problem. You're not the solution, but God has put the solution inside of you. His name is Jesus. And He can walk into the deadest of places and bring life. He can walk into the darkest of places and brings life. He can bring into the, He can walk into the most hopeless places and bring hope and bring peace in the midst of turmoil and in the middle of destruction. This is what God does. And the Bible says, God said, say to the house of Israel, their testimony is we're dry. And our hope is lost. And we're cut off from the, our parts. But God said, oh my people, I'm going to open your graves. And I'm going to cause you to come up out of that grave. You're going to know that I'm your God and you're going to be my people. I'm going to put my spirit inside of you and you're going to know that I performed it. God's looking for people. Stand out in the middle of that hopeless situation. Prophesy to them bones. I'll prophesy life. I prophesy salvation in America. I prophesy that God would begin to move and God would begin to speak to people just while they're at home or while they're driving down the road. I know it can happen because it happened to me. I was running from God and outside of the will of God and I was on a red tractor in Hernando, Mississippi in the middle of November 2012. God began to speak to my heart. God begin to talk to me and all of a sudden in the middle of the day I begin to weep like a baby. I begin to cry. God began to break my heart. I wrestled with God for a few days, but how many of you know that's a losing battle, right? I don't want to win a wrestling match with God. Finally, just like 
You know, Jacob, he touched my hip. I fell down in the floorboard of that old camper there one night and I just began to call on Jesus. God began to speak to them dry bones. God brought me up out of that grave. God caused His wind to blow into my heart and in my life. And I may not look like much, but I am part of the Lord's army in these last days. My God, I don't plan on being asleep when that when that pestilence comes to the door, I want to be standing there wearing not Saul's armor, but the whole armor of God. And I'm not, oh, I'm more afraid of offending God than I am hurting and letting down people. We just want to walk with Him. Prophesy to the dry bones. Prophesy to the wind. I've been able at work, go back there in the back of my camper and just begin to pray. This message has been in my heart. And I begin to think about people that I know and I just begin to call their names. And I begin just praying, Father, call your sons and your daughters from the four winds of the earth. God, they're dead and their bones are just bleaching out in the desert, Lord. But what looks hopeless to man, it's not dead in your sight. The Bible tells us that God calls things that are not as though they are. God doesn't look at things like we look at things. God looks at things according to His ability, His possibility. And how many of you know that God can change people in a short amount of time? Amen. And I begin to call people's names out. i got a whole list of names in this notebook. And I look at it just like talking to dry bones. People in your families. I've been, I've been calling out some people, brother. I've been calling out some people that were calling through. My wife told me the other night, one of them came to the prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and I just, I just began to weep on the phone because that's what God is doing. It may not look like much right now. It may be just the rattle of a dry bone, but keep prophesying. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep calling on God. Cause that wind to blow. Oh, sweet Spirit of God, blow in this world. Blow in this earth. Open up them graves. People are buried beneath sin and shame and dirt and filth and just the lies of the devil that says you're always going to be this way. Oh, God can just get it. Oh, He called Lazarus to come up out of that grave and said, get the, get the grave clothes off of him. Loose him and let him go. Let him walk free. That's what the Word of God can do in any situation. Open up grave. Let him out. Open up tomb. Death is overruled by the Word of the Lord. Death was overruled at Calvary. Jesus overcome death, hell, sin, and the grave. And because He is victorious, He has given us the victory. We are. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through Him that has loved us. We are not victims. We are conquerors. We are. And just like David, you know, he had been to Ziklag. And while he was gone, the enemy come, took everything he had, burned up his house, drug his family off. Everybody wanted to kill him. David went out there and the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes there ain't nobody else around you. Sometimes you're just so broke and so hurt, it don't matter who is there to say whatever to you. It just can't help you. But you get off with God. And the Bible says David began to encourage himself in the Lord. And he began to call on God. Ask God, could he go now and get his stuff back? And God says, yes sir. You will overtake your enemy and without fail, you will recover all. Go get your family back. Go get your stuff back. Go get your joy back. Go get your testimony back. Go get it all back because Jesus paid for the price so that we could have it. Let's go and take it. We're not a people that just take refuge and hide. No, we are mighty. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of every stronghold that the devil has. Death is overrun. By the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death 
has been removed. Just like a wash without a stinger. May buzz around, freak you out a little bit, you know. I don't know who would just raise your hand and say, Yeah, I want to die right now. <laughs> but I tell you what, the sting of it's gone. Because I know, I know, I know, I know. My last breath on this earth, I will be standing in the presence of this God. And I long to hear him say, Welcome home. Well done, you good and faithful servant. God, let me be that. Let me be faithful. I don't have to be the biggest. I don't have to be the greatest, the most popular. Just let me be faithful. Faithful to you. Faithful to the people in my life. Faithful to what you've called me to do. Faithful to this gospel. The sting of death is gone. Oh, grave, where is your victory? That was it before. <laughs> We've been reading in Matthew 27, verse 50, 51, 52. The first thing God did when Jesus died on that cross was He ripped that veil. God don't live in buildings and dark places. He lives inside of us. The Bible says the earth quaked the rocks rent, and the graves. Many of the graves were opened up. People been dead a long time. Got up out of that grave and started walking around Jerusalem. The cross of Christ is the answer to death, sin. It's the answer to what's going on in America. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. A law of sin and death doesn't dictate, it doesn't govern, it doesn't control our life anymore because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, God's law is that all life is found in Christ Jesus. John chapter 1 and verse 4, in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. Oh, Jesus, shine in this hour. Kyle, would you come and play? I want to just ask you if you would to stand with me this morning. Oh, Jesus, we pray, Lord, that You would shine in this hour. Oh, God, that You would be glorified in this day, in this time, in this hour of desperation in the United States of America and all around the world. Oh God, we pray, Lord, just like You brought Ezekiel to that valley of dry bones, God, You've brought us here for such a time as this. God, I pray that You would empower us. God, I pray You would stir faith in our heart. Just like, Lord, You did the prophet, faith to obey You. Faith to walk after You. Faith, God, to do what You've called us to do. God, I pray, Lord, for those dry bones. God, for people that are on the wayside. People that are lost. People that are buried in graves of sin and shame and addiction and bondage. Oh, God, I pray that those dry bones would hear the Word of the Lord in this hour. Oh God, I pray that You would raise up messengers to go into places like that. And as the prophet said, hear ye the Word of the Lord, O ye dry bones. Hear what God has to say. You've listened to opinions and you've listened to criticism. You've listened to the lies of the enemy. Now hear the Word of God. Hear the One who was covered in your shame, in your sin, in your guilt, so that He could cover you in His righteousness. Amen. Hear the One who took the sting of death. Hear the One that the grave could not hold. Hear Jesus! Hear Jesus, dry bones. Oh God, cause Your Spirit to move. Cause it to fill Your church, God, where it might be a dried up, dead group of people. God, to unleash the Holy Ghost. Cause the wind to blow, Lord. Raise up a living army in the day and the hour that we live in, God. Oh, Lord, instill faith in us, God. 
all determined. No matter what it costs me, I'm going to run after You. We'll open these altars this morning. If you want to come pray, call on Jesus right there where you are. You can. Open up your heart to the Lord. Speak in faith to dry bones. Ask God to move in your family, in your children. Some of you have family members. I have family members. Oh my God, they're not ready to meet Him. They're not ready to meet Him. And I thank God for this reminder in the day and time that I live in. Oh, the door of that ark is still open. God wants us to use us in this day and in this hour to speak. Oh, God's drawing men and women. Let us be the people of God. Let us be the people of faith in this hour. Oh, Jesus, Lord, we pray that You would be glorified. Oh, Jesus, we pray that in this dark hour, Lord, Your light would shine. God, put Your light in Your people this morning. Oh, God, we just lay ourselves down. What good are we in a valley of death? Oh, God, but how great are You. God, You take weak things and You make them strong. And You do it so only You can get the glory. All that no flesh glory in His presence. Oh, Jesus, if you're here this morning, listen, I'm not trying to scare you into salvation, but I do love you enough to tell you the judgment's at the door and you don't have much time. Jesus loves you. And He's not willing that you would be lost and that you would die in your sins and that you would go to hell. But He wants to save you today. It's very simple to be saved. You can't be saved by going out and being a better person or trying to do good things. You can't earn salvation. It's a free gift. The Bible says that the payment of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus this morning, you need to open up your heart to Him. And you need to tell Him this morning, confess to Him, Lord, I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I don't know You. But Lord, I want to be saved. I want to know Jesus. I want You to wash me in the blood of Jesus. And I want You to make me new. I want You to make me Your temple. And I want to be a child of God. And I want to serve You, Lord. And I want to be a part of the army that You're raising up in this day and time, God. I don't want to be swept away in the judgment. But Lord, I want to be safe inside of that ark. I want to know Jesus. Open your heart to Him and ask Him to come in and He will. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man, woman, or boy, or girl will open up that door, I will come in and fellowship with them. They will fellowship with me. Jesus is knocking today. Jesus is knocking. He just wants to save you. Just come to Him. Come to Him. You can bring all of your sin, all shame, all guilt. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank You, God, that You take us as we are. But You cleanse us and You make us new. Oh, God, thank You. As the song said, sin had left a crimson stain, but you washed it white as snow. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. Oh, God, we thank you. As the scripture says, you are a very present help in the day of trouble. Lord, this is a day of trouble. I thank you, God, that you're with us. 
I thank you, God, that you're our shelter, you're our rock, you're our refuge. God, you cover us with your hand, you cover us with your shadow. Lord, we want to abide in that secret place. Father, I pray that in these times we would draw near to you. God, that we would run to your presence. God, we would not be people that speak in fear. We would be people that speak like the world. Just foolish the words out of emotions, out of anger, out of fear, out of arrogance. God, I pray that you would baptize us afresh in the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, I pray that you would control our tongues. God, I pray that we would be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. God, let us be swift to run to that closet and hear Your voice. Not speak, God, unless we've heard from You. Not to be a people of wrath and a people of anger. Father, raise us up to be watchmen on the wall. God, for our families, our loved ones, our friends, God, our brothers and sisters in Christ, God, tell us what's going on so we can walk with You, so we can be aware. Pray that You would enlighten us, God. You would give us peace in the midst of this storm, Lord. Lord, in the harvest, God, the feet comes to steal the harvest. Let us be laboring in that harvest. be found to be faithful, God, to You and to what You've called us to do, Lord. God, we pray for Your protection. God, I pray no sickness, no disease, no plague, God, no disease, any of God, You use us right in the midst of it. Just like You use the prophet. saw revival in the dead place. We saw revival in the hopeless place. Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, for being with us. Thank you, God, that we won't leave you here. Until next time, that you go with us. Everywhere we go, Lord, we go with us. Lord, let us really be aware of your presence in this time and hour that we're living in. Lord, we just really pray that Jesus would be seen in us, God, in the way that we live. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah.